Awesome. Charles, Charles, what are your thoughts on Sinichi Mochizuki? Purported proof of the ABC conjecture. There's certainly a war between Fields medalists about that. Uh, it's an old number theory conjecture from, I think, the 1970s, 1980s. Um, what it is is not important. What What's important about it is the fact that it's too hard to verify. It's actually one of the reasons why we're sitting at the Hoskinson Center over at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the reality is that you have these overly abstract, very technical proofs that come out. And it takes enormous amounts of brain power for people to actually verify them. And there's literally no incentive in the mathematical community for the verification of some of this work. So think of it this way. You're a young, recently graduated PhD in mathematics. Now, the way math works is that if you're in your 20s and early 30s, you're super productive. Then you have a radical decline in your productivity as you get into your 40s and 50s and eventually get to your 60s. You're not solving big things. So you have a finite career and a clock ticking mercilessly that if you don't do things in that finite career, you can't get tenure. You can't get into a good university for uh, teaching. So if you're a graduate student, a postdoc, or a young professor, you look at something as daunting as the ABC conjecture, it's a Fields Medal class problem. Uh, so to get there and solve that without the luxury of tenure, you're probably not going to make much progress on it. Just like Fermat's last theorem, for example, it was one of those problems you, you don't work on. It said it's bad for your career or the hailstone conjecture uh, sequences like uh, the Syracuse problem, uh, the Collatz conjecture, these, these types of things. They're too hard. Okay, so that group of people on their own devices aren't going to take the time to open up 250, 300 pages of mathematical prose, read super technical proofs. Many cases are ahead of their time. What Sinichi did is he didn't just prove something in his mind. He actually created new math, new tools, new things to actually prove it. Okay, so it's uh, it's not a simple thing. And literally, you're going to have to spend six months to a year of extremely focused, deep work to get yourself to a point where you can have a strong opinion, unless you just so happen to be in that field, just so happen to be familiar with that research group. Now, Sinichi didn't make it easy for anybody. Normally, when you have the audacity to purport that you've solved a big problem, like the ABC conjecture or the Artin's conjecture or any of these things that are floating around the number theory world, um, you, you would go lecture, you'd go on tour, you'd spend some time with people. Like after Fermat's last theorem was proven, Silverman had a lot to say about it. You got together at Brown, they had working groups form, graduate students came in, they had seminars, and they were, the first thing they did is they simplified the proof. It went from hundreds of pages to like 30 to 50 pages, and they said, okay, I can understand it now. Okay, that's never been done. He just stayed in Kyoto, and he published in his own journal for this thing. And he said, I, and he said, I have solved it. His job is done. It's the mathematical community's job to figure out what I've done. Okay, that's, that's not good form in the mathematical community. And it's something that mathematicians don't look so kindly on. And that's one of the reasons why the other group of mathematician, the professor who has tenure and access to graduate students and postdocs and can kind of guide them, hasn't spent the time to really dig seriously into the ABC conjecture. And as a consequence, uh, that means it just sits in paper and there's a few guys in Germany that are certainly who are very credible. Uh, who are spending some time claiming that perhaps the proof isn't right. And there's a few other adherents in Kyoto who say it is. And it's a big debate. And most professional mathematicians have no opinion on it, kind of like the continuum hypothesis. It's beyond us in that respect, <laughs> um, beyond the industry in that respect. It's like, go go worry about that stuff, Wooden and the rest of the guys. Okay, so the point of constructive mathematics, the point of systems like lean or dependently typed languages, is Sinichi can self-serve a big chunk of the verification of the proof. We see this with the four-color theorem. We see this with other things that have been mechanized. The difference is the tools here are on steroids. They're much better than the older tools like Automath and Mizar and uh, things that came with the QED manifesto. It is my belief that if these tools are heavily invested in, which is why I put $20 million into this center, it was not a small investment. It's a permanent endowment. Uh, that we'll all continue adding money to throughout my life and career. It's my belief that over the arc, as people learn to use these tools, they become collaborative community tools, that uh, what Sinichi's successors can do 
is they're not going to just dump a 250 page tome on the mathematical community and say, good luck, everybody. Have fun, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. What they'll do is they'll decompose it into interesting things, improve a lot of those technical, very refined things with these proof assistants. And if it compiles, there's a high probability that it's right. Then because you've had the discipline to construct it in a way that's machine understandable. And a computer is the harshest of all critics because it can't take things for granted. You can't assume it knows something. I mean, you have to go all the way back to piano arithmetic and teach it what a natural number is. It's not simple stuff for a computer. You have to really work at it. What you can do then is you can show that certain things that would be of concern for a proof are resolved. Okay. And as a consequence, then. You can really lecture on and talk about how all these pieces fit together, how the agenda fits together. Andrew Wiles was very considerate in this respect. If you actually look at the anatomy of Fermat's last theorem, his proof for it uh, with these residues and these other things, what he did is he actually had these modules and they kind of plugged together in a kind of an overall giant proof agenda. And because each of those modules had you know kind of nice connections between them, it was easy to decompose the proof into understandable blocks that domain experts in those blocks could look at and dissect and say, well, now there's a problem here. In fact, the proof in 1994, the original proof had a flaw and it was only discovered because of the care and consideration that was in the design of this, uh, of that proof that was not done in the proof of ABC conjecture. Like new math was invented at the same time as the application of extremely specialized tools and a very incomprehensible paper was constructed. Uh, and if you use something like lean, you're forced to do that in the process of writing a proof. So you have self-serving, you have a platform for collaboration, you have a higher burden of proof than most mathematicians are used for, and you have a separation of concerns just like you would in any software architecture. And so the key is just to get to the tools to a level of maturity that they can be applied properly for the writing of mathematical proofs. And that's a collective game. And every day, uh, Mathematicians around the world, from Imperial to Max Planck, and now here at CMU and other places, they work together and they think about these things and they have all kinds of interesting debates. And the other thing is that you can switch your logics. So you can say things like, uh, yeah, I don't like CFC set theory. Let's, uh, let's go do something else. Let's live in a system where the continuum hypothesis is false, like the system that Wooten constructed uh, in these types of things. And you know, let's get rid of the axiom of choice. Let's see what happens. That's really cool that you can just pull things out and switch your logics and so forth. Say it's true under this set, but it's not under this set and so forth. You do that as a set theorist or a logician. You don't commonly do that as an algebraist or a topologist. So you don't get to the basement. You look at the basement dwellers and you say, live in the basement. And they're like the radiologists of mathematics. They live in dark rooms. And no one looks at that. <laughs> so anyway, those are my thoughts. I think it's a lack of consideration, and I, I think it's the output of an insanely brilliant person. Uh, let me be very clear. Sinichi's probably in the top 10 in terms of most brilliant mathematicians alive right now. I'd say number one is Terry Tao, and Sinichi's certainly in the top 10. And I think he's gotten to a point where he knows who he is, and he has a high degree of confidence in his brilliance. So he just doesn't really care to go and take the time that somebody in their 20s would do if they they solve something really huge. Uh, and it's going to be really fun seeing what people do from that. It's the, the other thing that sometimes is missed is if you look at like the Fermat's last theorem, for example, because this is one of those problems people have really talked about. So it's a great example. It's just it's a gift that keeps on giving. There was a, a brilliant woman named Sophie Germain who attempted to prove it in the 19th century and ultimately her agenda failed. However, Sophie's work actually inspired a lot of people to do a lot of other things in mathematics in the 19th and 20th century. And so sometimes the failure in attempting to prove something is actually a, uh, a great opener to other conjectures and other ideas. Uh, Riemann uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about things like the Goldbach conjecture and uh, prime number theorem and these things. And then we have the Riemann hypothesis, you know, so there's a lot of magic there that happens. And mathematicians often remember their failures more than their successes and their failed proofs and their failed attempts, their failed thoughts, at least unlocked something somewhere. If we can get that thinking, that computing that right now lives in the wet brain, the meat space that dies with the mathematician in part or whole, 
into a computing system, a, a digital mind. If we can extract that and put that into uh, that uh, that system, then when a mathematician dies, we don't quite lose them. Instead, a crude simulacrum of that mathematician, a shadow of that mathematician, remains behind. We haven't lost Rothendieck. We haven't lost Hilbert. We haven't lost uh, Emmy Noether. They're still there. Their papers are there. Their proofs are there. But the way they think is lost because the papers can't tell you enough. When you start using AI with Lean, mathematicians interact with artificial intelligence. They talk to it. It learns from them. They conjecture together. They work together. Part of who they are gets permanently imprinted in that system. And over 100 years of that usage, you'll have a gallery of specters of the great people from the past. And they're on display for all the new mathematicians. And that's the only way a field can get to the next level. The other fields, they have the advantages of tangible physical things. The ghosts of the past leave behind physical things they constructed. Airplanes and trains and computers and all these things, outputs of the brilliance that you then can be inspired and build on. So you don't need to remember the names. Like how many of you remember who created the cathode ray tube for the television? We don't even use that type of TV anymore. It was Professor Farnsworth. You might remember Futurama, Professor Farnsworth from Futurama, you know, that he was actually named after Philo Farnsworth. Uh, but you don't even remember Farnsworth. And by the way, he created that because he was interested in fusion. And he failed fusion but created the television and instead with the CRT. <laughs> and But you see that. It's there. And the successors of that technology is what you're looking at on your screen right now. We don't have that in mathematics. We don't. We just have the papers and the proofs. And we're only one generation away from all of that being lost. Everything. The paper can be there, but it'll be like a dead tongue a dead language, if no one bothers to teach it. That's the other important thing. One of the reasons mechanization of math is so powerful and so interesting above all the other things is that idea that we now get to leave something behind that's kind of like the cathode ray tube in the structure and the other things. So to me, it is one of the most exciting and vibrant and sexy things any human can be involved in. And uh, you know, I hope that the center can figure out a way to grow to that and inspire many young mathematicians to use Lean as a tool. It is one of the friendliest, nicest, most amazing communities uh, if you're interested. And actually, uh, Jeremy Avogad, the director of the center, is writing a textbook called Lean for Mathematicians, which will be released under Creative Commons license. That's the other point. Every output of this is open source. There's no intellectual property, no patents, no IP, none of that stuff. Math should be for everybody. There's no notion of credentialing a mathematician, any more so than credentialing Euclid or Archimedes or Diophantus or these people. It's, it's, it's a structured way of thinking, like critical thinking. It's a way of looking at the world and reality. That's not owned by academia. It's been preserved because no one else wanted to. And we couldn't find a way to work it into society like we have poetry and you know fiction and all these other things that we have and we take for granted. Uh, but hopefully we can find a way to liberate it a little bit and open it up a little bit. And you won't Springer Vale won't have monopolies. In these things. That's at least the vision. And it'll be really fun seeing where it goes. And more books will come after Lean for Mathematicians. It'll be Lean for Algebraists. It's kind of like topology for turtles. Lean for topologists. Lean for combinatorists. Lean for probability theorists and so forth. And we'll just keep adding and adding and adding. And hopefully the center will one day be able to get most mainstream mathematicians thinking this way. and. They interact with that plus AI, um, they're permanently part of the milieu of math.